Hey everybody, uh, this is Mr. White, and we're back. It's day two. Uh, we're going to be reviewing Era 2 today. So, um, Era 2, our dates for Era 2 are going to be 1648 to 1815. Um, oh, and I almost forgot to say this is important, but make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoy this video and you find it useful to you for your review. So, um, we left off yesterday talking about Era 1, right? And so Era 1 ends with the Thirty Years' War. So Era 2 is going to be this period after the Thirty Years' War. And uh, what's really nice about pretty much all eras from here on out is we have these really uh, clear end dates for our eras. So this starts with Era 2 with the clear end date of Era 1 being 1648, and then our clear end date of Era 2 being 1815. So, um, we're going to break into why that is. Um, before we do that, let's take a look, quick look at the trends that we're going to be examining. And a lot of these come right out of the Thirty Years' War, right out of the Treaty of Westphalia. So the big trends we want to look at is, notice that these are all political, okay? Right? We're looking at mostly political trends in this era. And what we're seeing is there's competing political ideologies. There's absolutism and there's constitutionalism. Um, these are going to be two different responses to how to properly govern. Remember, what we said yesterday in our Era 1 review by the end of it is that it seems like states are winning over religion. So now, the battle will not be between religion and states. It will be between states and their subjects, or maybe they should be citizens, right? So we're getting into a debate not between organized religion and states, it's between the people within those states and the state itself. Um, the greatest challenge, obviously, to these states is the Enlightenment. Um, cementing rational thought as the basis for European thinking, advancing notions of individual liberty, eventually fostering revolution in the case of France. Um, and we're also going to be noticing that states themselves are upsetting each other more so than really ever before. Um, states engage in organized warfare with one another um, and you know they're trying to ba have this balance of powers but there's a lot more interstate competition between 1648 and 1815 than there ever was back in era one um, states are now really thinking about their economies as a whole and how did their economies stack up to other economies how did their military stack up to other military states start judging each other more so um, let's start with the immediate after effects of, of Westphalia. Westphalia basically guarantees national sovereignty among states, and it shows that states are the ultimate sovereign power within their boundaries, not the Catholic Church. This essentially encourages an era of absolutism. Um, we know that absolutism is there to basically, oops, sorry, I'm going to go back here for a second. Um, we know that absolutism is really there to build a theoretical basis for the all-powerful monarch, you know, someone where the state is totally in control. We see that people cannot derive that kind of ultimate power from the same people that they used to rely on for understanding states. We think back, like Machiavelli and Bodin, and even Hobbes, to a certain extent, did not necessarily say that the ruler should be all-powerful and come from God. Um, Hobbes is very clear that the Leviathan comes from the people. So those arguments aren't going to work. They actually um, will mostly rely on some of Bodin's words, and then this guy who builds off that Bosway relies on this idea that it has to come from God. Notice now, though, that it's not the Catholic Church, right? The monarchy is still separate from the Catholic Church. If anything, they're almost more powerful than it. Um, so this power is not arbitrary. Um, it's supposed to come from a particular source. Um, Bodin helps reinforce this with some of his works. He says that nothing upon earth is greater or higher next unto God than the majesty in kings and sovereign princes. Um, the principal point of sovereign majesty and absolute power was to consist principally in giving laws unto subjects in general, and this is key, without their consent. So, um, a lot of these movements, by the way, isn't it weird how Busway looks just like Donald Trump, actually? It's like, kind of freaky. Um, a lot of these philosophers and absolutists from this period um, are going to really rely on God and religion, an older institution, to help justify their power. 
By the way, if you hear a weird background noise, it sounds like a weird, like a tingling background noise. My cat is at the windowsill eating her dinner. Yep. Okay. So, um, sorry about that noise. So, let's take a move on here. So, the, um, other areas where we see absolutism other than France, right, is we see them in Russia with the boyers getting uh, cracked down upon by the Tsar. You know, there's an increased presence of the Tsar. Um, we have Peter the Great kind of being the greatest example of that. Um, he adds a lot of roads, improves lights for elites. Um, he imposes heavy taxes upon uh, the nobles and, and even the peasantry as well. Um, he isn't afraid to exploit people at all. Um, he believes that it's okay oftentimes to exploit people if it makes the state stronger. Um, this is really similar to what Louis XIV believes, right? He agrees kind of with the Peter the Great way of doing things where you have to put the nobles down the same way Peter puts down the boyars. Louis XIV uses his Versailles system to basically keep the nobles trapped at Versailles, not tending to their own affairs, not plotting coups, not obtaining military or political power. Um, this is just, these are the methods of absolutism, right? Uh, this is the ways in which absolutists were able to secure control and move societies away from, you know, being decentralized, where nobles had a lot of power, to more centralized under one absolutist king. So the question is, could the church be controlled this easily? I mean, this is such a powerful institution. Um, the way in which the church is evoked in... France, and in Russia, really, is to use it to their ability to obtain more state control. Um, think about what Louis XIV does when he revokes the Edict of Nantes, right? The Edict of Nantes granted religious toleration to Huguenots or Protestants in France, and when Louis revokes it, right, he seems to actually be hurting the economic prowess of his state. Um, the reason why he's doing that, though, is it helps him gain more control over religion in his country. It actually secures his position as an absolutist, even though it does happen at the expense of maybe his nation's economy and um, his nation's prestige, right, in the eyes of Protestant powers. He's more concerned with guaranteeing political power. It's kind of Machiavellian. Um, <clears throat> absolutism actually even makes its way into England, right? We know that James II is a Catholic who sees the rise of all these other big Catholic absolutists and tries to kind of emulate it. Um, he even used um, kind of a state press to spread some of his values. And when the English see this, they, you know, they have a long history of being opposed to Catholicism at this point. They have a long history of being opposed to absolutism since the Magna Carta. The nobility are stronger in England than perhaps anywhere else, and they downright oppose him. They invite the uh, King of the Netherlands on over, William III, and he will become the king of both the Netherlands and England through the Glorious Revolution. Um, this new English movement would be based on constitutions. Constitutions, by definition, are designed to limit governments, right? They base the constitution on some principles the English can get behind, as well as some Dutch principles that have been pretty popular there, like religious toleration and the army and the navy being controlled by the legislature. Um, the state being centralized and um, interventionist. Um, this encourages political participation, um, and with the Bill of Rights, we can see that there's even um, actual real guarantees built into the Constitution. I mean, the English don't really have a traditional Constitution, but the Bill of Rights is probably the closest thing they have to it. These are all ideas that are espoused by Locke, right? Without Locke, we wouldn't have any of this. Um, Locke is writing in the 1680s about the necessity to all this stuff. He says absolute government is totally inconsistent with civil society. If the king has both legislative and executive power in himself alone, there can't be a judge, right? There is no appeal. Nothing is open to anyone. And Locke helps lay down the ideological basis for kind of the crazy revolutionary things that the English are doing. So on top of all this, Locke is also going to kind of therefore be the father of the Enlightenment. So. Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, as defined by many historians, 
right, comes from this kind of newer rationalism, stuff that had kind of been born out of the scientific revolution. And this new rationalism meant that the ruler was more willing than ever before to justify their authority. Now, this comes from a long train of changes in intellectualism, right, in Europe, with the Renaissance, people being humanist, people thinking for themselves, with the Reformation, people being used to questioning traditional forms of authority that were, they were not used to questioning. And then the scientific revolution says, you know how you question authority? The best way to do it is through logic and reasoning. So these new rulers have to use logic and reasoning to kind of back up what they're going to do. They can no longer shelter behind the term divine right. Instead, uh, these new rulers place more emphasis on the monarch as a servant of the state. Only by this total de dedication could they maintain their rule. So these absolute monarchs by the 1700s with the Enlightenment going on, they have to kind of transform what they're doing. Um, these enlightened, or quote unquote air quotes, enlightened monarchs don't have any intention of giving up power. They don't think that they need to pull a glorious revolution and hand off stuff to the legislature. They basically just want to reform the state so it looks like they're following the enlightenment without really needing to totally give up legislative authority. So what's the enlightenment going to do? Um, the enlightenment is rooted in a lot of values that we kind of understand today. They're a lot built off Renaissance, Reformation, Revolution values, um, thinking for oneself, um, uh, having the courage to use your intelligence, um, trusting in your own intellect, using reason, being a true individual, being skeptical of new information, being tolerant of new ideas, not just immediately assuming everything's bad. Um, believing that there must be balance, that there can't be someone who has too much power or some institution that has too much power, and believing that these institutions have to derive their power from social contracts. They can't just exist on their own. The people must essentially have some kind of tacit agreement with the powers that be. Robin Wink says, taking its cue from Newton and Locke, the Enlightenment now sought to extend the critical re-examination of received ideas to the most sensitive notions of the state, society, and religion. Basically, if people have been re-examining the basics of the universe around them with the scientific revolution, they're now going to re-examine some human constructs, like the state, society, and if, you, if it's not too controversial to call religion a human construct, religion as well. So we got two long-haired blonde boys who are going to be our kind of fathers of the Enlightenment, Locke on the left, Newton on the right. So did monarchs actually change because of the Enlightenment? Sort of, right? I mean, like, think about Frederick the Great. I mean, the dude was a militarist, although he embraced Enlightenment culture and befriended Voltaire and called himself the first servant of the state. Did he really introduce, you know what the Enlightenment was all about? Did he really follow Rousseau with popular sovereignty? Did he really separate powers according to Montesquieu? Of course not. Catherine the Great, right? She's, quote, enlightened, right? She reforms Russian society to have modern bureaucracy, education, religious toleration, re-empowers the nobility, but she also screws over the serfs. She doesn't encourage that strong of a legislature. She does not balance her power She's an absolutist who still believes serfs are scrubs, right? This is not this is not that enlightened. Even in Austria, where things are supposedly even more enlightened than these other places, there's still not really anyone giving up power. Maria Theresa, um, who was having her rule secured through the pragmatic sanction, um, had to make alliances with nobles. She actually had to give up a lot of power to maintain her rule because of the kind of precarious position she was in with her, you know, legitimacy being questioned and all. But to do all this, how she kind of got away with what she was doing is um, by making alliances with the nobles, reducing the power of the church, and empowering education, trying to put an end to witch burning. This all feels enlightened, but again, any core political change? No. Right, there's still no legislature, there's still no balance of powers in the government, right? We're still not seeing the serfs being free, peasants being freed, any of that stuff. By the way, fun fact, 
over in the Holy Roman Empire, you did have some people trying for this, like eventually uh, Joseph II, but um, it short-lived. So mid-century competition and conflicts is sort of the other big trend we want to look at. Before we break into this, I want to do a really quick review, right? We have some competing forms of absolutism and, and government, right? We have um, absolutists who are just hardcore in France. We have absolutists who are a little bit more enlightened and willing to reform to improve their image over in Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And then meanwhile, we have Britain, right? They don't need to reform their image because they're downright constitutionalist. Um, so it seems like people are constantly trying to balance um, how oppressive their state is to keep people following their state. With that in mind, they also know that another way to keep control of your state is to be a strong, successful state. Win wars, grow your economy. And so this is another battlefield in which they sought to win the approval of their people. If we can think of the Enlightenment and enlightened absolutism as one way of earning people's respect, this is another way. So we know that England and France um, are some of the biggest players in these mid-teenth century conflicts. Um, we know that they're the ones with the most at stake. They're some of the largest countries. Um, they have increasingly powerful representative bodies. Um, in England, they have parliament. France has this Estates General, but they have not met since the Thirty Years' War, so they're really not that powerful of a representative body. That's kind of a mis misnomer that I have going on on that, on that slide there. Um, economically speaking, they're both really strong. Um, they both have organized permanent debt, large-scale banking, paper money, private ownership of government-held debt, um, monopolies that uh, they lent money kind of all around. They're both very, very strong politically and economically. This is the result of the commercial revolution, right? They understand economics to an extent. They actually have um, real kind of modern states that get involved in the economy. But we do know that Britain is going to be in a better position. This is because, for the most part, throughout the 16 and 1700s, governments were buying wholeheartedly into mercantilism. And mercantilism made sense back then. There's a, supposedly, according to traditional mercantilist theory, kind of a finite amount of money in the world. This is because money, according to mercantilism, comes from specie, or gold and silver, right? Um, that's that's where you get all currency from. Therefore, you got to hoard that, right? And if there's only a limited amount of that in the world, the best thing to do is to get a favorable balance of trade, right? That way you can get more currency, more specie flowing into your country. Even today, if you want to gain access to currency reserves in your economy, this theory still holds true, which is that to gain more currency in your economy, you want a favorable balance of trade. However, currency doesn't equal economic growth, and we'll talk more about that later. So the main way to gain that favorable balance of trade when everyone else is trying to do the exact same thing and no one wants to trade with you is to trade with your colonies. By trading resources to your colonies, you can actually obtain a favorable balance of trade without actually really having to trade with a sovereign foreign country. This is going to require people to have lots and lots of colonies. And this is part of the reason why colonization and the slave trade speed up and intensify in the mid-1700s as governments become increasingly centralized. Um, and the slave trade is kind of the worst side effect of all this, right? This is killing 15 to 20 million people. Um, it, it, the slaves are seen as a commodity. They're just seen as another thing to trade to gain more of a favorable balance of trade. I mean, just think about what Britain did with the American colonies, right? Britain established an extremely favorably, favorable balance of trade. They would ship slaves and manufactured goods over to the colonies, and the colonies would ship back raw resources like cotton. I mean, that's exactly what Britain wants. So we get a Europe that, according to William Blake, right, is supported by Africa and America. They are dependent upon colonies for those balances of trade. And this 
largely remains the same, and this logic is kind of firm in Europe until Adam Smith and some other economists in the late 1700s start arguing that perhaps trade isn't just to gain currency. This is when people start thinking about some basic modern economic principles, right? Um, Adam Smith is a kind of the inventor of the idea of trade makes people better off, right? That value can be accrued through trade. Um, he therefore suggests uh, that actual freedom of trade can actually grow your economy perhaps even faster than um, just acquiring specie can. Um, acquiring specie in currency is very useful if you have to fund a large army, but if you're just looking for economic growth, just pure private sector growth, you're not going to get that without trade. So Adam Smith says, you know what's better than accruing specie? Um, why not just grow your economy and then when a war happens, raise revenue through taxes? And so Britain starts to shift over to this model of free trade and taxes as opposed to tariffs and mercantilism. Um, this is sort of called like the laissez-faire capitalism, right? Where you let the market check itself, loss of supply and demand, little government interference. Now, Britain doesn't do this overnight. And mind you, this is still a kind of controversial theory at the time. But the basic idea of competition being good encourages Britain to pursue some economic policies that allows it to grow much faster. Um, perhaps the greatest example of this is the agricultural revolution. When technological increases um, were accompanied by a lot of private investment, and um, a lot of freedom. And that freedom, um, for example, you know, the fact that Britain didn't have serfs, enabled farmers to get loans from banks um, and get new equipment, get an education, um, get new skills, make more money, and improve their position and make their farms more productive. So when farms become more productive, population of Britain increases, demand increases, um, people are allowed to move into cities now because there's more food production um, and food is cheaper. Um, Britain can focus more on ca cash crops like tobacco. Um, they can use methods that are safer for the environment in the long run, like crop rotation. All of these things enable an, a revolution in Britain that wouldn't have been possible without the basic tenets of, of freedom of movement, freedom of capital, free trade. This doesn't happen in the East, right? Because the East still relies on agriculture, not just for economic reasons, but for social reasons, right? Agriculture out east is rooted in peasants, rooted in serfdom. There's no motive for serfs to improve, right? Um, in fact, um, they would often shun technology because it would often mean that they'd have to pay more in rent because they're expected to be more productive. Um, there's also very little investment in farming out east. Serfs aren't going to invest into a farm they don't even own, right? If they're going to pay rent on the farm, right, why invest in it? It's like if you had an apartment, you wouldn't, like, modify your apartment to be, like, nicer or, like, go around and change up the outside of your apartment building, right? That's not your job. Like, you don't benefit from that. So the serfs aren't going to become better farmers because they have no incentive to. Um... On top of that, nobles and royalty don't really leave them the free time to experiment with that. And with all these guilds and all of these government monopolies through mercantilism, there's very little capital left to invest in private business. So, meanwhile, Britain gets to lead the way with the shovel plows, right? All of this puts Britain in a superior economic position by the mid-1700s. And this is going to make a lot of foreign powers quite furious and jealous. Um, the Seven Years' War is perhaps the greatest example of a war that's largely a duel about trade, right? In France and Britain basically duking it out because of their increasingly divergent approaches to economics. So we see a global duel between France and Great Britain on trade, and a European duel, which is a little bit of a sideshow, uh, between Austria and Prussia for kind of jockeying for territorial military power over Central Europe, right? This is not a war about ideology or patriotism or values that we kind of associate with a lot of wars today. This is a war about dynastic claims. This is a war about mercantilism. This is a war about trade. It's a much more boring war, right? Um, and we do know that this war would have never been won by Britain without the help of Prussia. Prussia, remember, used to have an alliance with France against Austria, but when they realize that perhaps they can grow their empire by allying with Britain against France and against Austria, 
um, that's when they kind of switch sides, right? They switch from France to Britain. The battlefields are all over the place. This is arguably the first global war, could be considered the first world war. Um, battlefields in, in, are big in Europe, Central Europe. They're big in India, and they're big in the Americas. In the Americas, it's called the French and Indian War. What this war does, and why we're talking about it, is it permanently cements uh, a shift in balance of power that had been in the works for many, many years. Um, previously, France under Louis XIV had always been the biggest military power in Europe. This war cements the idea that perhaps Britain is the bigger power. Um, and it also suggests that Prussia, which used to be a considerably smaller, weak, neglected power, compared to Austria, which was the much bigger, stronger power, um, that flips on its head now, too. Prussia seems like the stronger power than Austria. This helps set us up for the French Revolution. So, another quick review, right? We have changing systems of government in Europe, right? Governments are realizing they have to respond to the wills of their people. At the same time, we have all this economic conflict and these states jockeying for prestige in the econ economic sector. And you'll notice two trends, probably, by now, which is that, one, France seems to be the only country that is neither enlightened nor is it constitutional, right? It's just old school, hardcore absolutist. And then on top of that, they're the prime losers of the Seven Years' War. They're the obvious losers of this international trade war. So it'd be French kind of sucks in the 70s and 80s. This is part of the reason why the bread crisis occurs, right? Uh, the bread crisis occurs because of a whole bunch of debts that have to be paid off from the war and um, a, a general collapse of confidence in French markets. Uh, couple that with famine and a bad winter, and yeah, that's how you get a bread crisis. When people notice that there's a bread crisis and all the money is being spent on the glorious palace of Versailles, they're obviously going to be upset. And when the people are invited to vote in one of the first estates generals in over 150 years and then are locked in the tennis court as opposed to actually being allowed to vote, they see nobility, they see clergy conspiring against them, they look around the world, they look at the Enlightenment, and they're like, holy crap, why have we not done anything earlier? This is our time, right? You know, this is States General was a blessing in disguise. Now that we're finally here, let's stage a proper rebellion. And that's what they get, right? Um, all, of, all of the, the bread crisis and the, the tennis court oath builds up into a, a popular mass movement in France, which to a lot of Europeans really appears suddenly, although we know it has been in the works for a while now. Sorry, we have a we have an intruder. Um, so I'll just hold this beast here. So um, next we get is the fall of the Bastille. Um, we get French people marching in the streets. This is sort of the spark of the French Revolution because this is what enables people to feel confident and revolting around the countryside. Um, a lot of these revolts are very um, kind of have a, a social nature um, to them all. It's a lot about uh, how people can't pay off their, their feudal dues and how people are sick and tired of being serfs in the countryside. Um, and that's why one of the first things this new, as the king would call it, illegal National Assembly does is to end serfdom in France. And there's sort of like this growing rift, right, between the king, who has very little control of his country, and this revolution um, and what they're doing. And there's actually kind of things are going on simultaneously. Um, meanwhile, the National Assembly over in Paris keeps kind of growing its control. The king keeps on being forced to kind of retreat um, from his influence in France. And they're doing things like adopting the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, um, defining the individual and collective rights of the three estates as equal, um, forcing the French Catholic Church to cut ties with Rome, abolishing feudalism, but very little changes for women, which is especially upsetting since women were crucial to the revolution. These ideas, right, are largely rooted in the Enlightenment. And what you end up with is a whole bunch of hipster Parisians, right, getting excited about their new rights and getting excited about um, kind of finally having that liberal republic government that they were jealous of the British and Americans for having. The new constitution 
right, establishes a constitutional monarchy just like in England. And they sort of force the king to agree to it, and he kind of reluctantly does. He doesn't want to have to deal with the parliament, and he hopes and he's kind of conspiring that maybe in a couple of years he can, he can get this thing thrown out, and this parliament stuff can just be a small footnote in history. The social changes are perhaps a bigger deal. The political changes, right, are, are total the same exact thing as what happened in, in Britain, kind of glorious revolution, right? But the social changes are pretty crazy. Uh, Feudalism is totally abolished. Serfdom is banned. Clergy lose the tithe. The clergy are now elected. Um, people are required to take oaths to the state. I mean, these are massive shifts going on in French society. So not it's not just voting, right? It's It's not just... Um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a total change to the economic and religious and cultural structure of France. Um, eventually, though, continued frustration with how reluctant the king is to work with the revolution and the threat of invasion from Habsburgs out east causes Jacobins, the more radical party of the French Revolution, to actually overthrow the Girondins, the more moderate party, who have been kind of taming the fire of the revolution. This puts Robespierre, this crazy madman, in charge, and they get into the business of chopping off heads, and we all know how that goes. Eventually, the craziness of the chopping of the heads and the battles and the endless fear and the endless terror that is the Reign of Terror um, ends in 1794 when they kill Robespierre in the Thermidorian reaction, and in the following year, they adopt a new constitution. The new French Revolution will kind of return to more moderate values. They're going to kind of see the reign of terror as a little bit of a, a, a weird moment they had in the revolution where they got a little bit too extreme. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to go back and, you know, let the nobility exist or go back to a constitutional monarchy. No, they're going to still kind of press forward, right, with a five-man executive branch, no royalty, called the Directory. The Directory is considerably more limited than that Committee of Public Safety that kind of had dictatorial control during the Reign of Terror, but not um, nearly as, um, sorry, my cat is distracting me, um, not nearly as free and democratic as some previous French uh, legislature was in the early years of the Revolution. Directory is plagued by corruption, and it is a a uh, source of much frustration for the French people. So when Napoleon sieges a coup in 1799, um, this mega successful general who has defended uh, France and actually conquered Italy, people are more than happy to let Napoleon take over. He establishes a consulate, which is kind of like the directory, um, and it looks like the directory, but it's not like the directory because Napoleon is sort of in charge of the whole thing. Um, notice that the nickname I have for the consulate phase is the dictatorship phase. Napoleon is essentially a de facto dictator throughout the consulate. Napoleon, by the way, let's go back. Napoleon in 1804 just basically is like, hey guys, you know how I kind of like run the show? Let's have a vote. Do I kind of run the show? And the French people, along with some vote tampering, decide that, yeah, he runs the show and he gets formally appointed to be emperor of France. So, Napoleon embarks on some wars. We should know some of these wars. Um, how did he come to power, and why did he come to power? Why did the French people want him? And a lot of this stems from kind of older French history. France had always been seen as the greatest power in the uh, in Europe for a while during Louis XIV's rule. And, you know, with the Seven Years' War, they don't feel that. And now, with Napoleon, they're, they're seeing this kind of surging nationalism in France, and he kind of rides that, right? He is the, the dictator who gives um, them the success that they've been looking for. Um, one of the things to know about Napoleon, too, is he wasn't afraid to give people the vision of what they wanted, um, although he still pulled the strings. Like, notice how it says on here that he allowed near universal male suffrage to elect representatives. It doesn't matter that their power was limited. It's more about the idea of giving people a voice. Um, so, when after Napoleon becomes emperor, um, he does a bunch of big reforms to France. Like, he establishes the Concordat with the, with the Roman Catholic Church. And this is a, a huge return to Christianity, right? Remember, during the Reign of Terror, de-Christianization had been this big movement. But now the Concordat is all about returning the French people to Christianity. It, 
uh, declares the supremacy of Catholicism, but at the same time, it makes sure to require oaths of loyalty to the state. There's the Napoleonic Code, which cements the destruction of the nobility wherever the French go, right? It's a unified code of law that abolishes all social distinctions, right? Um, that's what the United States Constitution has. The United States Constitution makes it clear that there cannot be any social distinctions. That means no nobility, no serfs. The Napoleonic Code also do undoes some of the advancements made by women during the French Revolution, though, which is unfortunate. This, though, goes with the idea of returning French society to some more traditional elements, kind of like the Concordat. They both kind of fit in with that, right? They're not just impressing women for no reason, they're oppressing women to return France to what a lot of lower class people and a lot of just the bulk of the French population was more comfortable with. Um, to ensure that his rule was absolute, he was not afraid to use the secret police and ruthlessly put down dissent, um, as well as promote nationalism. This nationalism really helps because he's got a lot of wars to fund. Um, he struggles defeating the British at Trafalgar. He makes some money back when he sells Louisiana and kind of cuts off ties in the sea um, when he loses Haiti and he kind of just says, screw the ocean, I'm just going to focus on wars on land. And he's successful. He basically takes all of Central Europe by 1807 and decides, you know what, if you can't invade the British, why not just starve them? So he creates the Continental System. The Continental System tries to basically choke Britain by putting all of Europe and all of Napoleon and his allies, which is all of Europe, um, into one kind of big customs union. So mercantilist policies in max, right? Cut off. United Kingdom. But if you might notice in the map over on here on the right, notice that there is one mainland connection, Portugal. And that's sort of the thorn in Napoleon's side, stupid Portugal. So he's got a bunch of issues, right? The Prussians are rebelling, so he's got to put that down. Um, but the Portugal issue is really annoying to him because Portugal allows for goods to kind of sneak through his blockade, and it kind of is like the obvious hole in the continental system. So he invades Portugal. Easy, right? Portugal should be an easy opponent. The problem is, invading Portugal pushes Napoleonic armies into Spain, and that upsets Spain and creates kind of this massive civil war in Spain that the British are more than happy to fund and, and encourage. This creates uh, modern day guerrilla warfare with a lot of French soldiers sort of terrorizing Spanish and Portuguese populations. Um, meanwhile, a lot of central states are using the confusion to try to strike back. I mean, Austria attempts to strike back in 1809, but kind of gets crushed. And because of this constant drain on Napoleon, um, Russia sees that maybe they don't need to be part of this continental system anymore. Maybe Napoleon's weak after all. Um, when Russia leaves the continental system, Napoleon sees this as, you know, his system falling apart, and he needs to maintain it. He, that's what he did with Austria in the year before, so why can't he defeat Russia in 1810? So he tries to invade Russia. Um, he successfully takes Moscow, but the Russians burn the city on their way out, and because of a combination of Russian winter and just the longest of long marches and the fact that the Russians seem to not care about burning cities to the ground, he's forced to return to Paris with just a fraction of his army. This leaves him weakened. And Russia works together with Austria, Prussia, and Great Britain to stage the ultimate invasion of France, the Grand Coalition, the Quadruple Alliance, right? And Napoleon is forced to concede the throne in 1814, and he is exiled to the small Mediterranean island of Elba, never to be heard of again until he comes back. So meanwhile, while he's in Elba, the Quadruple Alliance is trying to kind of craft a new treaty for a newer Europe, right? They obviously want to return the, the Louis and the Bourbons to, to rule in France, sort out territorial adjustments. The goal is, with the Quadruple Alliance, to return peace to Europe from the craziness that is the French and Napoleon. And actually, there's a lot of royalists left in France who oppose the French Revolution who are more than willing to participate in the discussion. So in the midst of all this discussion going on in Vienna about how to reshape Europe now that Napoleon's defeated, Napoleon comes back. It's kind of funny, right? He appears in France, he sneaks off of Elba and gets to France, rallies an army, and in a hundred days he re-proclaims himself emperor, um, and he tries to stage one final comeback. 
um, and he is defeated in the famous Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Then he's properly exiled to the middle of nowhere, St. Helena, Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. No hope of ever getting back. Sorry, Napoleon. Dies in 1821, sad and defeated. So his legacy is that he actually, in a weird way, encourages Europe to work together. Europe wants to avoid another Napoleon, and royalists left behind in France, Austria, Prussia, and Russia work together with Britain to kind of keep conservative monarchical control of Europe for the next 100 years. Also, his code, Napoleonic code, encourages a lot of governments to drop serfdom for a few years. It comes back after the war's end, um, but it creates this feeling in a lot of European populations like Austria and Poland and Russia of what can happen, right, when um, the Napoleonic Code is put in place and people get freedom. On top of that, people start to see the power of nationalism. All this warfare, all of this Napoleon rah-rah go France for the French moves romantic nationalist feelings in people. All of this means that Europe is getting a little bit more dangerous, right? Lots of nationalist movements, lots of angry serfs who want their freedom, and monarchists who aren't afraid to work together now to keep these people down. And what we get to by the end of all this is the same exact question we started with in a weird way. In 1648, we see that states have all the power and that religion has been pushed aside. By 1815, states still have all the power, but now people have a taste of freedom, right? People have seen the Napoleonic Code, they've seen the Enlightenment, they've seen revolution, they've felt nationalism. And although 1815 really, at the beginning of it, doesn't feel that different from 1648, right? Just a lot of oppressive monarchies around Europe. It's a bunch of oppressive monarchies that have much more modern economies, much more divergent social classes, much more educated people, and it's going to be a lot harder for them to maintain oppressive control like they used to be able to. And we'll leave our story there. When we come back with Era 3, we'll see what happens when people get angry and they start making drastic changes to politics, society, and culture in Europe. Thanks for watching. This is Mr. White. Please like and subscribe. Sorry the video was so long. See you guys tomorrow. Bye.